Okay, thanks, Eric, and thanks uh, for asking me to this meeting. It's a pleasure to, to speak at Derek's um, celebratory meeting. It's a double celebration because it's 25 years this year since we um, first met in Pisa in April at the uh, ACAT meeting where David and Derek were exponentially uh, developing the, the, the knot theory and subsequently we wrote a paper together. Uh, and some of the work touched, some of the work I'm on touched, well, uh, we, we touched on, we'll be mentioning later on. Um, but others have sort of um, quite correctly uh, given an uh, appraisal of Jake's support through their careers. And I've certainly benefited from that through this Mercator Fellowship that Jake got me um, several years ago. But that's just another aspect of Jake's support for the community at large. He also just organizes our meetings for us and gets us together and gets communities together and gets us working together. And I think we should uh, be very grateful for that. And it gets us to meetings like this where we share different techniques to develop the subject, in particular QFT. But I, I'm going to speak today on a, a piece of work that came out of work with colleagues in Germany, uh, collaborators in Germany, in, in Dresden and uh, Cologne. We, we're working in <clears throat> condensed matter theories. And uh, this works based on an older paper and more recent work that's being written up at the moment. But since we <clears throat> finished that project, um, I've suddenly realized I could have done a more general calculation. And this is what this talks about, which is where the non-abelian symmetry comes in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so what I'm interested in, what we're all interested in, the structure of QFT, um, the uh, development of the precision calculations to be able to understand structural aspects and also get numbers out for real world phenomena. And that's mostly in this area, it tends to be particle physics, pushing perturbative beta functions to high loop order and uh, trying to sort of see beyond the standard model. But there's other areas of science that QFT underlies and one of them is <clears throat> material science of condensed matter physics. And that particularly, typically the connection with continuum field theory is in phase transitions in materials. Uh, and in the last 10, 15 years, with the development of um, this wonder material called graphing, uh, people are looking at these materials now to try and understand new phenomena. A graphene is a, a sheet of carbon atoms joined together in a hexagonal lattice. It's one atom thick, which doesn't always mean to say it's flat. It can be slightly crumpled, but it's got rather curious property in that it's incredibly strong for something so thin. But if you stretch it or, or contract it a bit, it undergoes transitions from what you'd expect carbon to be, which would be insulating to more <clears throat> conducting phase. And if we can harness this as a material, it opens up a lot of uh, opportunities to do um, uh, develop new materials on a, a microscopic scale. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I'm going to focus on is some of the theories that underlie these phase transitions in the, uh, in the quantum field theory. And they're not unrelated to models we have in, in particle physics and in, in, uh, the standard model. Um, the key thing I've been talking about today is this gross niveau yukawa type interaction, which is basically a scalar, in, scalar field with fermions and no structure in terms of large structure. However, because we're working with electrons, you can add in QED, quantum electrodynamics, to govern the dynamics of electrons as they move around the sheet of uh, carbon atoms. I'm not going to focus on that today. We've done work on that before. But the other connection, one of the other connections is that because the similarities underlying models, which are like four Fermi interactions in low dimensions with two and three dimensions, we could get an idea of looking at spontaneous symmetry breaking in the standard model by the mimic of the theory that undergoes, undergoes, underlies the phase sensations and the more complicated standard model spontaneous symmetry breaking. But in a scenario where you don't have to dig a tunnel underneath Geneva, which is 25, 25 kilometers round, and you have to bomb a lot of energy into it, you can do it in the lab. That's the hope. Whether it's completely uh, a parallel is another question, but it offers an opportunity to look at phase sensations in the simplest scenarios. But the main issue is the, the phase transitions are not unrelated to the Wilson Fisher fixed points of quantum field theories that we look at. The Wilson Fisher fixed points are something which we in fact use in dimensional regularization, in effect, when we look at 
the basic renormalization before we put the dimension to be back to be four dimensions or two dimensions or whatever. Uh, so the, the focus here will be on gross neural model. But the, the insight I've gotten in recent years working with the condensed matter community is that they endow these theories now with what is, I regard as a non abelian symmetry, which for us who do gauge theories is second hat. Uh, it's, it's basically another structure, group theoretical structure. We've seen talks this week um, on double copies and other aspects of the group uh, symmetry restrictions on the field theories. That just becomes an extra layer which we can handle. Um, but the other interesting development in recent months is a new universality class that's come out of um, studies of spin models. So on the condensed matter side, people look at spin theories where they have a discrete lattice and they put polymatrices at the at the corners and they describe the, the phase transitions with um, uh, lattice type models. And these models are also in the same universality class of criticality. It allows you to look at phase transitions. But one of those spin models has given rise to a generalized Grosnevoer model, which is called the fractionalized one. And it's got a different uh, group structure. <clears throat> and that's the focus that my collaborators have been looking at, which is where I was brought in to do some of the calculations. So that's the model I'll be focusing on primarily um, today. But so let me just go back and just do a wee bit of basics on phase transitions. Um, I'm going to talk about continuum field theories. In other words, honest to goodness, uh, d-dimensional field theories with no discretization of space time. And normally we focus on calculating beta functions and those beta functions are to allow us to evolve the coupling constant to high energy scales or low energy scales uh, in standard model or QCD quantum chromodynamics. To be able to have some idea of what um, what the behavior observables are, which are objects in nature, which we can calculate on the theory, which are independent of the gates parameter, independent of the renormalization scale. But there are other, what I call observables or renormalization group invariant quantities that are much simpler to derive and they come from phase transitions or fixed points in the renormalization group flow. So fixed points are defined by those coupling constants which satisfy beta of g equals naught. Um, so this equation here, if you can see my mouse, uh, the solutions to this define the fixed points. Now it's, I've typically given a one coupling theory, but you can have a vector of beta functions with a set of coupling constants. Every beta function vanishes and it's a set of points which all the beta functions vanish define the fixed points. So it's true for multi-coupling theories as well. Um, there's several types of fixed points. The, the trivial one at the origin is known as the Gaussian fixed point. And it's the one which is where we typically do perturbation theory around. Uh, coupling constants are small in the neighborhood of the, of the, of the origin. And um, so we can have an abandoned perturbative approximation in that region and get back to the free field theory, which is what the Gaussian fixed point is. Yeah. However, the more interesting one is that is the one that derives from the Wilson Fisher fixed point. And this is defined by uh, the d dimensional theory. So if you imagine that if you could calculate uh, in d dimensions, where d is not the critical dimension of the theory, but it's the dimension slightly above or below or somewhere off into the complex plane away from the integer dimension that you're working in, then the beta function develops a, a term at the start, which is. Um, order epsilon, where epsilon is close to the critical dimension of the field theory. Okay, now this is basically reflecting the dimensionality of the coupling constant. A and B are the one and two loop coefficients of the beta function and so on. Now I've typically written A and B here as uh, epsilon independent and that means I'm in the MS bar scheme. If you're in a scheme which was not MS bar, in other words with a finite renormalization, these coefficients would depend on D or the epsilon effect, and that would be a different uh, scheme. Uh, but let me just, it, what I'm saying today is it's independent of the scheme, so it doesn't quite matter what scheme I'm in. But the fixed points defi defined by the zeros of the beta function, if I take the first two terms here, obviously I can get the zero from G equals naught, 
but I also get a non-trivial zero, which is order epsilon from the origin. And I say epsilon is a complex variable, so the coupling could be complex. And we overlook that in D dimensions because we're not in a reality situation. So issues about unitarity, breaking, et cetera, are not really relevant. It's only in a limit going back to four or two, whatever, that's relevant. And obviously the fixed point depends on the coupling of the uh, coefficient of the beta function, which can include group structure and all the symmetry properties of the theory. And there's obviously corrections from the B term and so forth, all the way down the line. Um, since I'm going to deal with the gross number model, this is an example of the one loop term. It's got n dependence where it's an SUN symmetry. I'm putting F on the group there because it's a flavor symmetry. Now, what's the point of the fixed point? Well, if it was a gauge theory, it would be a gauge dependent object. But despite that, you can calculate gauge independent, scheme independent information from the fixed point. Um, it comes through what we call critical exponents. If I take the wave function renormalization group function and evaluate it at the, at the fixed point, I get something called eta, which is the wave function in almost dimension. And that's going to be a pure number or going to depend on the group Casimir's or any parameters in the theory, but it's independent of scales and it's a physically measurable object. Of course, we truncate a series to certain orders in perturbation theory. And by that, we sort of have to terminate. And so it'd be, truncation errors, errors. <clears throat> but it's a measurable quantity and that's what the phase transitions are governed by these exponents. Obviously you can calculate other ones, the critical slope is a correction to scaling exponent. And obviously the beta function vanishes at the fixed point, but the slope doesn't, it's a, it's a renormalization invariant. And again, this is measurable. And these define the properties of the theory in D dimensions. Obviously I did the perturbed expansion up here with order epsilon, but in principle, these are D dependent and can exist beyond the critical dimension up to any dimension you like. So they're very universal properties of the theory um, in all space times. Okay, now, how do we work with this? Well, we have to do an approximation. Um, there's various approximations. Monte Carlo does things numerically. Uh, there's D-dimensional conformal field theory in more recent years. Functional renormalization group where you can evolve operators across the spectrum using the Wilson renormalization group uh, formalism. Uh, you can do perturbation theory and then use maps to prodi approximates between various dimensions and get a behavior. And then there's the large N expansion, which is what I've worked on over the years. Um, whatever you do, you have to do something to, something to uh, get to the dimension of interest. And in condensed matter theory, it's three dimensions, which is always one away from two or four. So when we do epsilon expansions, we have to sum down from four or sum up from two, and that's not straightforward, as some of you are aware. Now, there's a secondary aim in this talk uh, is to look at aspects of the large N formalism for another problem I'm interested in. I've decided to do this for a general Lie group. Um, the problem with that will become apparent later. Putting in a non-abelian symmetry is trivial in some sense, but the motivation is to try and understand how the higher order Casimirs that will come in in perturbation theory come in in the large N expansion. And this is a little toy model where you can do this. So that's the secondary issue because ultimately we'd like to be able to understand gauge theories with an unabelian symmetry and similar methodology. So let me get down to Lagrangians. Uh, we know the four Fermi interaction in four dimensions is normally normalizable, but it's renormalizable in two. And this is the Gross Nouveau Lagrangian that was written down in 1974 uh, and it has got several very interesting properties. It's renormalizable. It has the same background to quartic theories with scalar fields in four dimensions, but it's asymptotically free in two. Uh, I've got an SUNF, I've got an SUN flavor symmetry, but as with any quartic interaction, you always linearize the interaction. Uh, by introducing auxiliary field. And it's this Lagrangian which is the key thing throughout uh, all the calculus to do. Uh, obviously you can put a mass and criticality masses are irrelevant because they don't scale. Uh, the masses run to zero, fixed points are scale free, so the masses are irrelevant. Um, the sigma field here doesn't propagate, but it defines the dimension of the sigma field through the interaction. Now, one interest for models like this is that 
they got popular again in the early 90s because they could be models of composite Higgs, mod, uh, composite Higgs fields, where the sigma would play a role of a, uh, the, so the sigma would be the Higgs field, and then psi bar psi would be the composite fields, uh, the fields that make up the composite Higgs, uh, Higgs field, except this is in two dimensions. You'd have to have a four dimensional theory. Well, you can construct a four dimensional theory without property. It's called the Gross Navoya Cavan model, and it's, it's termed the ultraviolet completeness. And what that means is this is not renormal, this not this would be super renormalizable in four to make it renormalizable. The sigma field has to become an ordinary kinetic term. But if that becomes an ordinary kinetic term, you have to have a quartic interaction, and that would be your Higgs potential. And this was shown by Zinjurston in the uh, early 90s. Uh, so that would be the corresponding theory of four dimensions that's in the universality class of this theory in two, because it's the same core, core uh, cubic interaction, with the same core uh, fermionic and uh, kinetic term. And this operator is not relevant in four. The quartic uh, vertex would be relevant in four. So the sigma field depends, it changes across the dimensions. Now, the extension that people looked at for the condensed matter problem for the MOT transition years ago was uh, a variation of the gross number model with the Carol Heisenberg one. And the only difference is to put a polarized spin matrix in here, lambda. On, you can linearize it, but you have to have a vector of scalar fields. And I've written down the ultraviolet completeness of this theory. Uh, it's just uh, by analogy. So the pi field would have to have an ordinary kinetic term and propagate, and obviously have to have a quartic term for renormalizability. But the same core interaction here spawns the other interactions as you go through the dimensions. If you go down in dimensions, this becomes irrelevant. Um, this becomes irrelevant, but the other operators become relevant, and that makes the renormalizability in two dimensions. But in between two and four, we have the three dimensional theory that describes the phase transitions in the carbon sheet, the graphene sheet. <clears throat> now, the fractionalized gross number model that I mentioned earlier on, the more recent one, is a variation on that where you replace the parallel matrices by SO3 matrices. Uh, and the SO3 matrices satisfy this uh, relation, which you can just encode into your files. And that's where I come in on the more recent work with my colleagues is to do the uh, SO3 calculation. So I reworked all my SO2 calculations with a different group theory structure. And then Dumbo realized afterwards I should admit it for an already lead group and start it from the more general case uh, with the usual group Casimir's. Then it could have taken the SU2 and SO3 results as a corollary of the more general result. So it's the more general universality class with non-abelian symmetry that I want to focus on now and go through the construction. And basically the large N expansion technique which I use is to work completely now in the universal theory with Vesalius technique from the early 80s and just apply the formalism from scratch. So I mentioned earlier on about the ultraviolet completeness. Well, if you extract from what that, if you extract the lesson from that, basically means the large end theory will work with this Lagrangian. We've got the core kinetic term and the core interaction with the uh, non-abelian surgery and some function of all the other scalar fields. And that varies as you go through dimensions, but it's irrelevant, irrelevant for the large end expansion. I call these spectators. And I've rescaled the coupling constant out here to have unit coupling because at criticality, there is no coupling constant. It's just replaced by some number. So you just start with this version of the theory. Um, this comes along for the ride. Everything in this f of pi in the fixed dimensions is contained within this interaction as effective vertices. So life becomes a bit simpler. The other aspect of the formalism that we work completely in coordinate space. And I want to focus a lot more on coordinate space than I have in the past because uh, Oliver is giving a talk tomorrow on his uh, uh, graphical functions and the similarities but differences. And I want to sort of add some of the, some of the ideas to that debate this week. Um, so in, in uh, coordinate space, the propagators all have a scaling form with potentially um, corrections uh, to scaling, which I'll come back to later. But the key focus is on the leading term and the dimensionality of the field in the Lagrange at criticality determines the power of the propagator. And if you look at the dimensional analysis of Lagrangian, the, the fermion field has dimension, which is d over two. So I'm setting d equals two mu here, just for shorthand. And the, uh, the pi field has a propagator, which has got one, but there's corrections to both 
and these are the anomalous pieces. The mu and the one are the canonical pieces. And eta is the anomalous dimension of the fermion field as I had before. And chi pi is the vertex anomalous dimension of the operator that we have in the theory as well. So both operators have anomalous dimensions reflected by chi and eta. And just for the just for the future, the this combination of exponents is d plus one minus chi. And chi and eta will have order one over n expansions starting at one over n with mu dependent or d dependent coefficients, which also depend on the, uh, the group Casimirs. And the beauty of the Vasiliev method is you just take these propagates and put them in Swinger Dyson equations. And we'll hear more about Swinger Dyson equations later. And you just self consistently solve for the unknowns, which are the exponents on a uh, an amplitude for a uh, combination of A and C. A and C are just X independent objects, just to get a scale, as uh, to get an overall normalization for the propagators. And that's, quote, all you do. And these are the leading order diagrams, and next to the leading order diagrams for the two point functions. Uh, of course, you have to calculate the integrals, but in principle, this is all you, do, you look at. And you note that in the diagrams are written down, there's no dressings of the propagators. And that's because the anomalous dimensions automatically uh, incorporate the, uh, the, uh, the self-energy corrections on each line. So you automatically sum up those diagrams by taking the generalized anomalous dimension. What you haven't done is got rid of vertex corrections. So there's two diagrams, one over n squared, the vertex corrections, uh, these two, which are actually divergent, as you would sort of half expect in quantum field theory but you can analytically write the rise with a delta. And if you do that, it's possible to calculate them and have simple poles in delta at this order and double poles in next order. Now, how do we calculate? We use what's known as conformal integration or uniqueness. So the rule for uniqueness or conformal integration is that at each vertex, you have a sum of exponents. You integrate over the vertex point so this is not like core and momentum space where you integrate over loops. You integrate over the, the points where the edges join. Uh, but the, the powers of the propagator joining that point are not one that there would be in perturbation theory. They're different. Now I've taken generic alphabet and gamma here. But the rule is this is not possible to integrate except in a restricted set of cases, an accountably infinite number of cases. And this, the, the first case where you can integrate this vertex is when alpha plus beta plus gamma is two mu plus one. So it's d plus one. If that condition is satisfied, then you can immediately calculate the integral. You get some overall normalization factor where it's just products of gamma function, uh, which I'm not going to dwell on. These always come along for the ride every time I do an integration. And you replace the vertex where you're integrating by just the product of three propagators. This is sometimes called the star triangle relation, but it's in coordinate space. There's a parallel of it in the momentum space, of course. Um, there's a duality where the, if the line, the, the propagator opposite the point where you're, the opposite the original propagator you integrate over is dual to it. So it's mu space time dimension over two minus the exponent. If this fermions is an adjustment for the, the X slash or the Y slash, just a plus one. Now, seven aspects I need to point out. Uh, for the Gustavo Yukawa, Carol Heisenberg vertex, two alpha plus gamma is two mu plus one minus chi pi. So unfortunately, the vertex is not quite correct for uniqueness in the large end setup. However, with the regularization, you can calculate with subtraction methods to be able to get around that with uh, still using uniqueness. So the ways around it. And the second point is there's various ways of proving this formula, one of which is just do the Feynman integral. Uh, either you have the Feynman integral associated with it by using uh, the condition and you end up with a hypergeometric function, which simplifies into a geometric function when the condition is satisfied and you get the answer on the right hand side. That's brute force. The other way to do it is by conformal transformation, and I'll mention those later on. And the rule for the conformal transformation is that when any line joins, so you define an origin for a, an external point and then take a conformal transformation. So the rule is that uh, you replace every line joining the origin by two mu 
minus the sum of the exponents joining that point, which here would be two or two mu plus one in the case of a fermionic vertex. It would be two mu plus one minus alpha minus beta minus gamma, which is naught if the condition is satisfied. So then you just get an integral of a bubble or a chain integral, which is what this is effectively. And that's the rule. There's no rule for QCD because it's um, got a gamma matrix inside it. Um, now, just applying the formulas, we get these results first order and next to leading order. And the reason I'm showing these is several points. You see the group customers coming in from before, CACF. And also this combination of uh, psi functions coming. I've written this psi function, so it's got a Z expansion near two, dim two dimensions. Uh, and it's, these are typical of what you get, but the leading on next to leading order are trivial to get. Uh, The correction to scaling that I had in the, which had the exponent lambda uh, can also be incorporated within the formalism. And in the kinetic matter languages, the correlation uh, uh, scale exponent. And it's slightly more involved because you have to calculate the two point function scaling function before you solve the equations. And it involves a hardened set of gamma functions incorporated in this notation. But there is a subtlety with the gross niveau case, which I want to point out to you now. It's to do with this function q that comes in mu no, uh, sorry, lambda at leading order is mu minus one dimension of space time over two minus one. And if you look at that formula for the specific example of the exponents we've got, it turns out this is singular. And that singularity means there's a reordering of diagrams in the uh, Dyson Swinger equations. So you need higher order diagrams to be able to go to one over n squared to get the second order correction to the exponent lambda. Uh, this means just more diagrams to calculate. And these are the diagrams where the dot indicates the insertion of the correction to scaling. So this is a vertex correction on the uh, two-loop self-energy. Uh, likewise, this one with the insertion of the line. This is a vertex correction on the external leg. And then to get the usual characters, the uh, primitive, non-planar and these other diagrams uh, which are well non-planar as well with these various decorations with the insertion. Now I've illustrated these graphically because those of us who do gauge theories automatically go light by light which is not something out of Star Wars it's basically this set here if I cut down this line I get four external wiggly lines which you could regard as photons and that would be two goes to two photon scattering and these are regarded as tougher diagrams. <clears throat> but there's two bolted together here. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's two bolted together here. And each one's got a, uh, a Lie group generator at the vertex. So there's a lot of groups theory associated with this, which we have to take into account uh, for the, the calculations. And the typical combination is written here. A and B are external the external uh, group indices and C, D and E are the internals. I've written them sort of different orders here because the way the uh, the, uh, the, the pi field goes across varies from loop, from the left loop to the right loop, but it's proportional to delta AB. Now, in the uh, mid seventy, uh, mid 90s, uh, from Astrid and von Mittbergen uh, and Laren calculated the uh, four loop beta function QCD and they had to take account of group theory graphs, uh, graphs with this type of group theory. And they have a very elegant package called color.h, which uh, allows me to do the group theory for this problem. And it involves uh, rank four fully symmetric tensor, D, A, B, C, D. The F here means the fundamental, but well, it could be in the adjoint, for example. There's a rank three symmetric tensor, which we all know about in Lie groups, which is D, A, B, C. And this calculation is absent. absent. But I'll get the D, A, B, C uh, tensor in, uh, in the problem, which is, uh, Going to be products of these two things when, the, when there's a shakedown on the, the calculation. So it's possible to code this in automatically and run through the calculation. And um, this is the second order correction, which is sufficient, it's significantly more complicated than the original one for the, uh, the original icing model, gross niveau case from the mid 90s, which Vasily and I did separately. But you see the rank four customer is coming in here uh, at second order large n. And there's seven new functions here uh, that come in. This phi comes in, uh, 
there's all the decorations and the, the rest of it's on the next sheet. Unfortunately, the form they get a bit big. And there's this data here, which are the uh, second, uh, sorry, the derivative of the, of the side function. And these incorporate zetas. So if you were to expand these objects out in epsilon expansion near four dimensions, they would correspond to renormalized S group functions near four dimensions or equally two dimensions, if you did it near around two dimensions. And this would show you that two orders in large n, the corresponding renormalized S group function to all orders at this order in large n would only have uh, rationals and zetas. Uh, it's not a proof, it's just an observation because obviously there's going to be non zetas further down the line. Uh, at higher order large n, higher order power to two, at some point you'll get them. But the key thing here is now I've got this general formula, I can specify groups very simply and take limits. I'll talk about that towards the end. Now, the other aspect of the facility of work from his group, Honkin and, and, Piz, and Pismark as well, was that he pushed the calculations to one of n cubed. Which is, this is, I can't stress how much this is a well ahead of its time. Uh, this was in the early 80s. Um, the formalism was set in stone earlier on by Polyakov in 1970 and Parisi uh, a few years later, where they were doing what's now known as the conformal bootstrap method, in essence. The way I'm using what's now known as the large end conformal bootstrap method, which is what I've had to rename it after the conformal bootstrap people uh, come in and corner that market. But if you remember before, I didn't have dressings on the two point functions, but I had vertex corrections. This method goes around that by getting ready, rid of vertex corrections in the self-consistent uh, Serena Dyson formalism. So these are the diagrams that contribute to the calculation of A to 3. Uh, you calculate the vertex functions and through a formalism that I'm not going to go through, you gain the um, uh, A to 3. Now, these are all primitive diagrams because there's no vertex corrections. But the dot that's on each vertex is not accidental, it's deliberate. The dot represents what's called a Polyakov conformal triangle. Now, if you remember that the vertex of the theory is set in such a way that it's not unique. But the Polyakov conformal triangle uh, is in some sense mimicking not the uh, absence of uniqueness, uh, but allows you to calculate the, these diagrams exactly. So let me explain what a conformal triangle is. So if you imagine an ordinary vertex with arbitrary um, exponents meeting at a point, Polyakov replaced that point by a triangle with arbitrary uh, A1, A2, A3 exponents internally. Obviously, there's some proportionality function here. Would you choose these internal exponents, which are completely unseen and not relevant to the field theory, for each vertex, by making each vertex of the triangle unique? So these are the conditions here. So if the triangles are all unique, then there's lots of tricks you can use to evaluate the integral. And this is the conformal transformation that you use. You say x goes to one over x, but if for a vector it's x mu goes to x mu over x squared. Or if you take um, what would happen in a product of, in a propagator would be x slash minus x, y slash goes to x slash, x slash minus y slash, y slash over x squared, y squared with a minus sign. But if you bolt a lot of these together, with a y slice minus z slice, there'll be a y slice here and another y slice for the next propagate. So one of the y slices, so the pair of y slices cancel off a y squared. So you retain the same string of gamma matrices round a diagram after conformal transformation as the original diagram, purely because there's no gamma matrix in the vertex. And that allows a lot of tricks to be used. So with the vertex replaced by a conformal triangle, you can calculate the diagrams. But leading order, as David reminds us on many occasions, um, their hardest diagrams sometimes to calculate are the previous loop order to the higher order in the expansion parameter. And that's the case for the leading diagram, which is just a triangle. So this is the full setup for the conformal triangle uh, uh, definition of the original one loop triangle diagram. So each vertex is now replaced by its conformal triangle. Uh, these internal ones are chosen purely because of the alpha here, here, and here, and the external one I haven't drawn at the top. 
there's a regularization coming from the external line because the equations, as I said before, are diverging. So you have to regularize each diagram. And there's two regularizations. There's a delta here and a delta prime here. <clears throat> and I've arbitrarily put the origin at the top. So how do we evaluate this? Well, every vertex now is unique. If I take a conformal transformation, I replace every line joining the origin by the two mu plus one minus the sum of the exponents at a vertex. And if you do that, you get this. It's the same diagram, but the zero, is, this line's removed because the sum of the, the, the exponents at that line uh, are two mu plus one. Now that means the only points to integrate are the ones on the hexagon that goes around here. X and Y are external. So this immediately gets you down to a two point function. And um, this is an integration point and that's an integration point. So again, immediately integrate these two diagrams. And I'm not carrying factors through this in the, in the slides, but you imagine the state of paper beside you where you carry the factors and you get this diagram, which is two point function, which you have four integrations on and a lot of parameters. But this is where you have to think. And the facility of trick was to write this as a diagram that looks the same with that, the top line removed, but you multiply by a function which represents the discrepancy or the compensation for the absence of it. This can be evaluated because it's just, again, simple chain integrals. And you get a, a, a result, which is this. Uh, sorry, this, which is, uh, you get a result, but the, the, the compensation function can be written in this form, where basically it's because it's a function of this combination of parameters. So the orders we're calculating, and then you can write down the expansion. It's in an exponential because it's easier formulation because we always write a, a gamma function x logs and it's got an easier expansion. And then the idea is you calculate the coefficients x1 to x4. Well, how do you do that? Well, the very simple thing is you, um, I, took the original, uh, I took the original point here to be at the top for the origin. There's no a priori reason why I should pick that point. If I pick this point here as the origin and do the conformal transformation, these two lines disappear and this collapses the other way. But if you look at that, the combination there is going to be um, different for the behavior of the compensation. It's going to be delta primed uh, and delta pi. Likewise, if I pick this point here, uh, the collapse will be here and here. And so the discrepancy function will just depend on delta pi. So we've got three different ways of evaluating this diagram, but they've all got to be equivalent. They'll all have a similar um, compensation function like this, but a different expansion parameter, because the argument would be different BF, B, which would be delta prime minus delta tilde, as I said, and FC, which would be delta tilde. And so three different ways, plus all the factors that I neglected to write down in the slides, brought together, they should all be the same, and that's sufficient to be able to solve this to two orders. And that allows, that allows people to write down sufficient terms in the expense of leaving out a diagram to be able to evaluate uh, f rate of three. And this is just an example. Uh, I haven't written down all the terms, uh, but you see that you get the corrections involving uh, uh, obviously the parameters themselves written out properly, but you get these combinations of uh, psi functions, which is where the vector they come from in the uh, results I've shown so far. Uh, the higher order diagrams come in in the corrections to scaling. These are the two formulas to find the, the vertex function. The first one here uh, represents the fact all the diagrams have to sum up to one. It's a very simple self consistency equation. And that fixes one of the internal parameters. Uh, the second equation is, in effect, equivalent to the two point function calculation I did earlier, but summed on the vertex functions. And uh, it's easy to calculate this. The higher order diagrams have been evaluated years ago. It's just a question of decorating with group theory. But the leading order diagram is a bit harder to calculate, which is why I have to weld on it. So in all of his formulation, he sends off a point to infinity for a three point function. And that in some sense is similar to what I do with sending the conformal transformation in. Uh, I just make one point irrelevant and you're left with two point functions. It's similar, but it's probably not connected and it's just I want to highlight that uh, this morning uh, uh, to, in, in uh, 
and uh, anticipating what Oliver's going to talk. And sorry, Oliver, put pressure on you. Um, but um, so, so what do you get? Well, you get a result which is not dissimilar to lambda two, uh, in the sense structurally it's got calcium structures. Obviously, the, I, this now tags where the, the light by light diagrams come in in the calculation, which is kind of nice because you can sort of look at the structure of these diagrams through perturbation theory. If you just focus on the expanse of these objects in powers of epsilon. Uh, the other feature that comes in is that there's another new function, which I call psi. Um, uh, this is a known function from early times when Pacific's work on this. And it appears in non carolly symmetric theories at large n one over n cubed. Uh, I've never quite understood the Carroll symmetry aspect of this, but it's come up in two calculations, one of which has been written up separately, uh, one of which I've known uh, from the early uh, 90s, mid 90s, from the West Amina model and supersymmetry. But it's a, it's a horribly complicated function to define. If you take this two loop integral with decorations of, well, obviously epsilon depends, but in d dimensions, v minus two, v uh, minus one, and I regularize the, the central line. It's the derivative of this integral, it's the derivative of the logarithm of this integral with delta equals naught that defines psi. Now, we know if we've got a two loop function, a two loop two point function, if we have epsilon order from one on the lines that join the, uh, the external points, we can expand that in zetas. Uh, if there's any decoration, of order epsilon on the center line, that's a problem in that that brings in non, it brings in multiple zetas basically, which is what Dirk and David have been, uh, we're, we're looking at in the, the mid nineties. And this is the connection with uh, where David and Dirk and I got working together in these problems. In our paper, David showed that uh, this integral can be analytically expressed as a hypergeometric function in D dimensions. But the complication is it is because of the differentiate with respect to the delta parameter here, uh, you have to differentiate the arguments, the parametric arguments of the hypergeometric function to really define the function. And that makes it harder to write it down as closed form function of ones we know. However, what we did uh, extract in that paper was the epsilon expansion of psi near two and four dimensions. And it has zeta phi three or zeta three five. It has the u six two in old, in old, in old music. Uh, but we now know it's all orders uh, in epsilon, and uh, that's sufficient. Now, David and Dave wrote down a, an integral in a, in a phi four theory in their early work with um, these multiple zeta structures, but it was never shown whether it was realized in the field theory. Oliver and uh, others have now found those in the field theory in 5.4. This was another example, an early example of where the zeta 5.3 can appear in the field theory because we expand out in the powers of epsilon to find it at a certain order. It's probably not the earliest order, but it comes in. It is possible to evaluate the integral exactly in three dimensions. Uh, it involves log twos and zeta three over pi squared. And that's purely because in three dimensions you, you can exploit Three dimensional uniqueness of the diagram exactly. I'll write it down. Vasiliev uh, did that. Now, I haven't talked about checks on the results, but those of us who look at non abelian gaze, if we've got a group uh, generated inside an interaction uh, for, say, a Yang Mills, we immediately get QED from those calculations by just notionally taking T to be one. Uh, just taking uh, the probably really mathematically unsigned limit of setting the generator to one. Uh, well, what that really means is you replace the casimers by the corresponding object uh, in the similar limit. So the abelian limit would be taken CF to be one, TF to be one, TF the uh, trace of TATB. Uh, obviously, the, the, the cast group casimir would go to one, but the abelian limit has to have uh, FABC to be naught, so that CA goes to naught. So I reproduce everything that was known before in the gross number model by taking that limit from the results that presented today. The other results that have been known is the SU2 mod cons, uh, insulating phase structure, which is slightly different, it's SU2. So it's 
still non abelian so it's three quarters and a half. CA goes to two, but the group cast goes to five with 64. And that reproduces what I had before. And then the more recent one, which we've done, uh, is SO3, uh, which has uh, got a slightly different structure. If you go and look it up in some table, uh, the group cast is 20 over th uh, three. Uh, taking those limits, we reproduce what I did uh, with my colleagues. Uh, but also, all these results agree with all that's known in perturbation theory. Um, for most of these models, it's either two dimensional or four dimensional. But in this case, the fractionalized one, we've only got four dimensional results. Uh, we've calculated out to three loops in that and got agreement with the large N. So they both tally off, which is reassuring. Okay. Now, once you've got a generalized result, you can just look at uh, different group structures. And so I've written down the three dimensional results here just for the adjoint quotes for a bit of fun. Uh, so uh, put the Fermi into the firm fundamental. Uh, the group Casimir is obviously changed, but the reason I've written this down is it shows you the structure uh, more succinctly in three dimensions where the light by light diagrams have an effect. And uh, it identifies this term as a light by light contribution uh, over and above this contribution. And for Ada, uh, <coughs> for Ada you go uh, slightly differently. I kept this combination here because this tends to pop up a lot. Uh, for the adjoint case, it doesn't quite decouple here. But um, if you're interested, you can put the numerical values in and see what it looks like. But that's the kind of uh, more general aspects that one can do with this formalism. Since doing this, I've been looking at other universality classes with a different um, underlying interaction. I'm playing around with that and applying the same tools to sort of look at other problems that were interactable. It seems to be a fairly robust way of doing things, taking a general Lee group approach. So just let me conclude. Um, I've looked at a more general type of criticality class, universality class for this fundamentalizing gross level type interaction, which opens up a whole idea now of looking at more general structures. Um, I can't emphasize enough on what's the color package that for and form has been, makes life easy for doing the group theory. Uh, you don't have to sit there with a pen and piece of paper manipulating group generators around the, the diagram. And it's easy to identify structures inside results and in principle in all orders of perturbation by iterating through the epsilon expansion. So I'll, I'll finish there. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. Thanks for your nice talk. Please feel free to unmute yourself um, and raise your hand or speak just up if, if, you, if you can. Um, I have an immediate question to to go just one slide back um, the three dimensional thing you showed. Yep. So so since you have this result for an arbitrary Lie algebra, is, is there any special cancellations that you see for? I mean, for example, here right, I could see this bracket that you mentioned yep. in the third line from the bottom right. So is you can imagine that there's a special situation where this vanishes and you drop the zeta three term or things like that. I I did look at that and off the top of my head, I think it doesn't happen. Okay. But I, this is actually quartic in, uh, it's actually, uh, it's a quartic uh, polynomial in, uh, in, in, in the number of colors. Uh, it has to depend on, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen for low values of uh, colors. And I have a feeling it doesn't. I, I should say, I haven't looked at the exceptional groups. Yeah, so I was just wondering, since you have all this data, I'm just curious if there is some something funny well, happening. Since you've raised it, I, I think of what I'll do is I'll look at it afterwards and if they come across anything, I'll put it in the I'll put it in the write up. Or make um, some I'll try and remember to make some comment in the write up. Just yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a question from David. Yes, you you've reminded me that in 1996 we did epsilon expansions about two and four dimensions to get towards three, and there we encountered multiple zeta values. But just out of mathematical curiosity, I wanted to know what the epsilon expansion was about three dimensions. And if you remember, Tolia Kotikoff and I mm -hmm. actually did that, because I knew that you would get alternating Euler sums, the same yeah. things that you get in the um, magnetic moment of the electron. Uh, is there any use of those epsilon expansions that we did about three dimensions? 
There could be, David, because um, I, I didn't put the slide up. I had it in an earlier uh, version of the talk. I think you may have remembered this, may, may have seen the slide before. What you can do now is you can plot the behavior of the exponents in D dimensions from two to four. And uh, a, this is important because not only can you do that in large N now, we're using Paddy approximates across the dimensions. You can also do it in perturbation theory. You know enough perturbation theory in two dimensions up to say four loops and the four dimensions down from four dimensions to four loops. You can do what's known as a matched Paddy approximate where you use the Paddy information near two and near four to write it down and interpolate the behavior of the exponent across the dimensions. And you can plot that. You can also in the function renormalization group, they can plot the behavior of the exponents across D dimensions. And they all have a similar sort of, it's like a hump, like a bell, but it's offset sometimes about three dimensions. So what we could do with the epsilon expansion around three is expand in the neighborhood of three to see how well the, mm. um, the maximum matches the shape of the other ones. Yeah. Now it's not something, it's, until you mentioned it, it never occurred to me. Um, and how many, I can't remember what order in epsilon you went to, it's obviously going to be um, breakdown, but what it could do, it could influence the the perturbative expansion that people do from two to four, with the epsilon expansion from a high order perturbation there, to try and sort of do some sort of global fit based on the data we know, limited data we know from perturbation in large N. I mean, it's, um, it's, 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 a, it's not it's an exercise that could be worth doing, but it's not something um, uh, I might have the tools to do uh, uh, immediately. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I see no questions at the moment, so so let's thank John again. Thank you.